we come to this place knowing that God awaits us. We come to this place knowing that God will welcome us. Let us respond as we hear God's call to pilgrimage and set our faces forward toward the new Jerusalem. Let us pray. Loving Father, we wait upon your unfailing love and seek to take refuge in your presence, asking that your spirit, for your spirit, as we worship you this day, praying in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 34, verses 8-14. through O haste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. In preparation for silent prayer, we consider the needs of the United States of America, the family of George Gray, the family of John Titherington, the family of Wesley Lopes, Lou Brower, Peggy Lynn, Carol Langloy, Mia Falvey, Cody Pound, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, the people of the Middle East, all servicemen and service women, all prisoners of war, all innocents caught up in violence and unrest, all God's creatures, both great and small. Almighty and everlasting God, we praise you for having given to us, your Son, as the light of the world, revealing to all your saving love and grace. We now present, O God, the worship of our grateful hearts as we gather in the light of your love. During this time of reflection and praise at the outset of our week, 
we pray that you would give us a glimpse of your heavenly glory and that we might find within ourselves the grace to follow you in your paths towards your kingdom. In our lives, may the cross be our byword and love divine provide an inspiration to persevere in ways of honor, obedience, and devotion, joyfully playing our part in service to our brothers and sisters. O Holy One of Israel, in whose name Jesus came to minister to us, we seek your direction in continuing Christ's service of healing, his deeds of compassion, his kindnesses to the least among us, and his selfless works of sacrifice and self-denial for all. May our efforts in emulating the example of Christ inspire others to acts of beauty, service, and worship, so that our society and our world might more fully bear witness to our affection for one another and to your desires for our betterment. Redeeming God, we pray that we might be spared temptation, strengthened mightily in all goodness, faithfulness, and constancy. May your word take ever stronger root in our lives so that our every thought, desire, and deed might fully reflect your will for our lives. Envelop us, O God, in your tenderness and generosity that we might be filled with your virtues so that we might lead lives of integrity and wholesomeness. Merciful and most loving God, perfect in us the likeness of your Son, reflecting his righteousness, renewed in his spirit, and encouraged by his triumph over adversity and suffering. May the sorrows of this life yield to visions of the glories of the life to come. And we pray that the afflictions of the present age might be speedily eclipsed by the splendors which await all those who have put their trust in you. Admonish us, O God, when we have fallen short of your glory, but then raise us up to greater heights as we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson is from the New Testament, the Gospel according to John, chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, and then skipping to 51 through 58. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over 
so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled it twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And now turning to verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Here end the morning scripture lessons.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me will never hunger, and whosoever eats of this bread will live forever. One of the major themes of scripture is hunger. The Bible opens with a scene regarding forbidden fruit. At its end, the Bible closes with a vision of God's reign that promises us that we shall hunger no more. In between, it is hunger that gave Jacob an advantage over Esau. Famine drove the Hebrews into Egypt where they became enslaved. In the book of Ruth, heathen exiles are driven by their hunger to serve a foreigner named Boaz. Ruth and Boaz's great-grandson, a shepherd boy by the name of David, wrote one of the most famous lines of the Psalms, promising a God who prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Those are part of our Old Testament heritage. The theme of hunger continues in the New Testament. A great-grandson of David, named Jesus, prepared for his brief but essential ministry by fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. The conflict over the Lord's Supper in Corinth hinges on the inequalities in the serving and distribution of food. Jesus himself was charged with the sin of gluttony, and the disciples of Jesus were charged with sinfully harvesting grain on the Sabbath when they were hungry. In our own lives, different kinds of hunger compete for our attention. People pray for food, for health, for jobs. And Matthew has Jesus assuring all his listeners that, quote, indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, unquote. Thus, it has been part of the mission of the church to address hunger in many forms, disaster relief, homelessness, illiteracy, health care. But not all hunger is physical, even though satisfying our bodily needs, though necessary to life, is not all that we require. For humankind does not live by bread alone. Other hungers bring individuals to our community of faith. Is there some longing deep within our souls that brings us again and again to the meeting house? It may be something that we cannot quite put into words. Some need that issues from deep within. Some sense that our hearts will never be at rest until our hearts rest in God. When we recognize that yearning from within, then we can begin to grasp the meaning of the observation that we do not live by bread alone. Our tables can be buckling under the weight of roasts, casseroles, steaming vegetables, fresh fruit, cakes, pies, and yet we can still have a hunger within. So in this morning scripture lesson, when Jesus had fed the 5,000, the story is not even half over. Physical nourishment, though necessary, is not sufficient. And that is what brings us to the table that is set before us here today. For this is a supper which only the Lord himself can provide. The bread which satisfies totally is the loaf which is upon the communion table. It is not, after all, our physical hunger which has brought us to this place. It is our hunger for Christ, for Christ's presence, so that Christ might abide in us and we in him. Growing up in northern Illinois, I lived only a few miles away from a Pepperidge Farm bakery. I was particularly fond of their cornmeal and molasses bread, which I later learned is called Anadama in this neck of the woods. 
At the industrial bakery in suburban Gro Downers Grove, you can see enormous mixing vats kneading hundreds of pounds of dough at a time. There are machines to shape masses of dough into loaves of various shapes and sizes, with conveyor belts to run the uncooked loaves and rolls to the appropriate ovens. At the end, you can see and smell the finished product tumbling out of the ovens, only to be shunted off to another location where they are bagged and sealed. You can imagine how hungry the sights, the smells, and the sheer vastness of the operation can make you. It is sort of like walking into a house on a cold New England evening and getting a whiff of soup on the stove. And for the first time in hours, you give attention to your physical hunger. This morning, as we move to the communion table, what each of us will receive is but a tiny piece of bread and a sip of the fruit of the vine. It would not be enough to satisfy our stomachs if we were physically hungry or thirsty, but then that is hardly the purpose of this meal. Why we are here is to have the bread and the cup help us to recognize the longing, the feel, the hunger within us for Christ himself. For only Christ has the power to satisfy our deepest needs. And so we take the bread and the cup, knowing that we will never be filled until Christ lives in us and we are living in him. Amen. God comes to us and to our world many times and in many ways. The Church has recognized at least two forms in which this Advent is undoubted. The descent of the Holy Spirit upon us at the time of our baptism, and the presence of Christ when the Lord's Supper is shared. During this supper, we recognize that it is Christ who presides, and it is at Christ's invitation that we are able to approach 
as we see in the elements of the loaf and the cup, that Jesus is present to all of us who hear and respond to his call in faith and hope. Let us pray. Forgiving God, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup to joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. This we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and he broke it to share it with his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. After they had finished their supper, Jesus then took the cup, saying, This is my blood in the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink you all from this cup. And so this we do in remembrance of him. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim his death till he come again. Let us pray. Because the broken bread has meant our healing, because the outpoured cup has meant our life, because our common sharing has meant the communion of our souls, and because we have here been graced by your presence, we give you thanks, O God, and pray that our lives be renewed in the life and love of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen.